All right, welcome to OzHeads podcast number 14. And today we're joined by a very special guest, one Miguel, <laughs> Miguel. Shodell, who is uh, the national sales manager for Crown Heads and Oz Family Cigars. Thank you for inviting me on the show. We didn't have a choice. Thank you. <laughs> um, we really ran out of things to talk about and people Thanks. to see. So I'm here. Yeah, good to see no, you. Man. No, no, no. Miguel, to... Miguel happens to be in town. You're, you're also on a bunch of podcasts. I do. Uh, you know, I always joke with everyone. I say, if you shoot your podcast between 10 to 4 p.m., here comes uh, the job. You, you get John Huber. After <laughs> after 4 p.m. to midnight, you get me. <laughs> and all the pods are after what you know. Most of them are most after. Are like, yeah, yeah, night. yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. get all boozy and yeah. 10 o'clock at night, still talking about cigars. So, yeah, well, welcome. Thank you, brother. Very yeah. happy to be here. Obviously, you know, I watch the show. I promote the show when I'm out there. Yeah. And I talk to everyone about it. And um, so, very happy to be here. What's and your favorite episode so far? <laughs> you know what's really funny? Um, your guys' episode with... Whenever you guys have the dog jump up... <laughs> That's every episode. In fact, where None. is she? Yeah, I know. I mean, like, oh, I, I couldn't bring her. I, I totally... Her. I was running this, out the door and I forgot her. This is going to get 50 views now. We're, we're doomed. She's, she was kind of looking at me longingly when I was leaving. <laughs> My dog does the same. Yeah, but I mean, like, I should have grabbed her. I didn't even think about it. She's, She's a was good like, luck charm. I was, in a, I was thinking about too many different things. But I, I was I did, I did. was here when you guys interviewed the, our Canadian distributor, Brigham. Yeah. And I thought that was awesome because... Uh, as a national sales manager, and, I, and I'm on the road as much as any of my sales guys, and I do a lot of events, a lot of tastings. And believe it or not, one of the things that consumers ask me about is the international business. What are people ah. smoking in our international retailers? And so I obviously I have a great relationship with Brigham and, and uh, Paul and Rich over there and the rest of the team. So I actually talk about them a lot. So it was cool to see them on the show. Uh, because I, one, I love them, but I actually get asked a lot about international. People are curious. What are people smoking? What are the costs? I was, I was curious too, because like I didn't yep. know like what it was like to actually walk into a tobacconist in Canada. Yep. I'd heard all these stories about this black curtain being pulled yep. back and yep. all these crazy things, and they kind of they cleared the air on a few of those things. So. It was good. You know, I go up there uh, once, twice a year to do events, and uh, we have uh, incredible crown heads and Oz following mm -hmm. in Canada, and among other international accounts that we have, Germany and Hong Kong. Uh, but it's 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 neat. It's really really neat. So very proud to uh, to be able to spread the word on these two incredible brands. How long how long have we worked with one another, Miguel? How long have you kind of? Well, I started stalking you and John back in 1998. <laughs> Uh, Fairmount Hotel, downtown Chicago, Big yeah. Smoke. Yeah. That's when yeah. it was held downtown. Fairmount or Fairmount or Fairmount? Fairmount. Fairmount? Fairmount. Yeah, Fairmount. 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 Not Fairmount. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was like, okay. Um, I don't think there'd be a hotel. Event, no. Not a bad name for a hotel. That Fairmount. Was, Fairmount. 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 We I'm charge sure you it, Fairmount. I'm not, two I'm, not nights, sure three. Fair, I'm not sure if the Fairmount is a Fairmount, but yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. story. So I used to go to the Big Smoke in Chicago, living in Cincinnati, and in 98. And what I loved about that hotel was it was a fancier hotel. And so you could actually smoke in your room, a cigar in your room. So as a young guy, I would put on the white robe that they'd have in your room and I'd sit in my room and smoke and I'd go down to the big smoke and I would come see you and I'd come see you and but not in the white robe not you in the white would, robe you would, no, you no, would no, change no. I wear a suit yeah I wear a suit <laughs> maybe my wife or friends were with me and so that's when I started bugging you about you know how would I work because in 98 I fell in love with CAO cigars I fell in love with the Lunaverse Maduro. that no, when, well, when I started smoking in 98 yeah, in 96, I, I started smoking cigars. In 98 was the first time I would say I fell in love with cigars. And that was my favorite brand. So, John, uh, back on the days of different um, boards and things that you would post, I yes. would follow you on these boards. And I got to tell you, it isn't that long ago, really, in the scheme of things. But as far as technology goes, it's a long time ago because you used yeah. to post on these boards. And I it, didn't know what I was doing. It was weird back yeah, then. Was I mean, not like today you get on podcasts or all yeah. these different things. You were like this now. anonymous person behind the scene yeah. kind of a thing. Yeah. And so I would follow you on there. And then obviously, Tim, you'd come to Cincinnati or Columbus, Ohio to do events. I'd go and, and, and go to your events and sort of begging you for a job. And I said, I think I have to move to Florida to get into business. And you said, no, no, you can stay where you're at. And then luckily, so many years later, you, you were able to give me an interview and and you, yeah. you didn't promise me a job you said i'll get you an interview 
And if it works out, you get you on the team and you got me on the team. And, and so that was almost 21 your, years ago. What was your, do you remember your first interview? Yes. Oh, yes. Talk about that because ref refresh our memory. It was that. on Osceola. It was the okay. Crown Heads office. 223 Osceola. Wow. Oh, yeah. It was the CAO office at it was the time. It the CAO yeah. office at the, the time, Shanty. Osceola. Yep. It was just Mickey and you. <laughs> okay. Shout out Mickey Pegg. Mickey Pegg. Mickey and Pegg. then uh, the second interview I did was in Jono's basement. And it was oh, like okay. a firing squad. We call that the Ring of Fire. Either right. Ring of yeah. Fire. <laughs> I was there in the middle. Then it was Mickey, you, and Mike. And, and you were like 12 years old at this time. I was about, yeah, 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 yeah. My voice hadn't cracked at you that were, point. Actually, no, all jokes aside, you were very young. You were, what, 21 maybe? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. Really? Uh, uh, yeah. I, I, I consider myself very fortunate because I was able to get into the industry that I love, that I wanted to pursue in my very early 20s. And so fast forward to now, you know, it's been over 21 years I've been in the business and, um, you guys have almost not been able to get rid of me. I mean, I've almost been with you guys that entire time. Well, there's more to it than that. Yeah, but it's been a lot of fun. And but I always remember that. I remember Jono, and I remember being well, was Jono there at that meeting. My no, father. No, he no, wasn't there no. at that meeting. But when I finally got the job and I got mm -hmm. the offer, and I drove down to Nashville to sign the paperwork, um, you guys had stuck me in the uh, <laughs> warehouse for a couple hours to look what an order looks like when it gets submitted and how it gets packed. This was at Osceola. At Osceola. At so okay. my, uh, there me, wasn't really a warehouse that in wasn't, Osceola. Yeah, that was like a, it was a me, small office. Miguel no. Casarin was back there. And oh, then God, that's yeah. where I ran into your father, outside of Big Smoke. Yeah. yeah. Your father's back there just looking at cigars. <laughs> and uh, Saying, ship it. Ship it, ship it. And he was talking to me about the gold. Uh, and and uh, yeah, so, so those were great memories. And was able to get on board become a sales rep you were in the what what was your territory at that time ohio indiana michigan and then about three months on the job uh kentucky was added to my territory oh wow which made sense because i lived in cincinnati which mm -hmm. if people don't know you know cincinnati's on the border of ohio and kentucky yeah and i i did that for probably seven years seven years and um got to know john really well i got to do a bunch of events with you and your sister eileen eileen yeah, yeah, yeah. for whatever reason Columbus, Ohio became like the Eileen. Oh, they loved her. They loved her in Columbus, Ohio. It was, <laughs> and like the stores would play um, that song, like, come, come on, Eileen. Eileen. <laughs> when she would come into the stores. That's funny. And I, I got to tell I you a no cool idea. story about your sister. So the That's first great. time she hit the road with me, Mickey calls me and says, now you look, you make sure you take her out to a good dinner after the <laughs> event. And after the event, I said, okay, what would you like to eat, Eileen? And she goes, I really want a Mexican pizza from Taco Bell. And I what? said, I, I said, I think Mickey would kill me if I took you to Taco Bell. And she goes, don't worry about it. She goes, just take me to Taco Bell. She was exhausted. She had traveled that whole day. Oh, yeah. Did this wow. huge all day event. And it was a lot of fun. Always great travel with oh, her. That's great. You, you had a following in Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky that was amazing. <laughs> and so it was like, depending on where I'd go is who I would request. Oh, that's funny. You know. And then, and then John would come up and do stuff with me at the party source. And mm -hmm. I think to this day, John, you hold the record for a biggest sales in a four hour span or three hour span with the party source. It was we the, did like over two hundred and fifty boxes. Yes, oh wow! Bigs. Yeah, Thank boxes. God. That was a different time. That was, a, that was the rock and roll. That thing. was the rock and roll tour. Yeah, yeah that was cool. And uh, we did that on the was barge. That a, was that a special cigar that we did for Rock yeah, and Roll? We did do. A, I think Here's it was a tattoo like a, on the back on your back. I still have that tattoo on my back. Um, but it was a, it was a, it was a special cigar. cigar. It was branded, banded. It was like a box pressed. I don't even remember what it, the blend was. It was like a Maduro. It wasn't called Bandana, was it? No, it was not <laughs> called Bandana. <laughs> it's an inside no, that, was, uh, okay. that, was be that was before. It that. was basically Brilliant. a one box to a six box deal. And so we what had. What was it? So they could only buy that blend? No, no, they could buy there? any CAO. We just had stacks. Of Those boxes were the free ones. Those they were, were like, the free goods that you. Oh, so they, they bought, if they bought a box, then they got that box? They got. So many of those cigars, and basically oh, by see. the time you got to the six box deal, you got like a guitar, you got cups, you got swag, you got a hat, and then you got that oh, box wow. of those cigars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And someone gave me one not long ago. They I, found I remember the, the logo. logo. Warehouse. I remember the logo. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was pretty the, cool. Someone gave you one of those cigars. One of the rock and roll cigars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> 
Somebody gave me one of those too. It might have been at uh, an event we did. We did together. Cigars Hall. International, I yep. think it was. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And we had like a, a local tattoo artist <clears throat> painting something too. Yes. We had that in every stop that we did every on that stop, tour. Which was you uh, a local tattoo, tattoo was, artist that was there yeah, that was well, we, giving people tattoos? No. no. No, no, no. They literally would like take, I don't know, whatever the imagery was, and then they would paint a painting of this as a tattoo. Because tattoo artists are artists. I mean, they can draw and everything. And at the end, we would just raffle it off. But we did that. Mm. Party Source, we did it in Detroit. We did it. Detroit, you made a cool shirt. You remember that? Yeah, we did some cool shirts for Detroit. And then the one at Jungle mm. Gyms was cool because in, in in Fairfield, Ohio, you did one at Jungle Gyms. And what I liked about this tattoo artist, he went to um, he went to like um, like a Goodwill and bought like a broken guitar and, and bought some really cool stuff. And then at that event, he had brought his uh, apprentice, mm -hmm. his tattoo apprentice, with him, and uh, and they just. Basically, what you would tattoo on a person, they were tattooing these items with paint and markers. And mm. it was a memory. It was, well, I, it, that was awesome. It was, a good, it, was, it was a fun concept. I have a few tattoos, time. you know, but not as many as you have. Maybe more than you. You probably have more than me. <laughs> and, uh, and it was just neat to watch them actually do art not on somebody but like actual mm. it was that was really neat um but then so then after cao sold yep. then then talk about like what you did after that so after cao sold i stayed on board for a couple of years um uh and then i remember going out to dinner with you at bonefish in northern kentucky and you said well you know that's where you uh, took me too i always yeah i, I took always you to took bonefish. me to bonefish <laughs> girl i was like i thought i was special yeah no. yeah yeah i took you both to bonefish yeah. it was like it was like my uh that was that's my your go-to it was my go-to better than taco bell way way better yeah, than taco yeah. bell and so um i remember going out to dinner with you and just talking about my future in the business and then a week after i had an event with charlie Tarano talked about you know my future in the business and then uh after everything was kind of coming to the end there in 2010 ish yeah um uh basically charlie Tarano said look you know if you want to come with me and it was kind of a uh it made sense because at that time Tarano was making all of our caos pretty much except for the flavors and vision at the time mm -hmm. everything else brasilia italia Criollo, go on amx2 lx2 all those would be made by um so we had a yeah, very good relationship with Tarano. we distributed Tarano. so i just kind of made the move over to Tarano, and i eventually became his national sales manager and so i learned how to be a salesman through cao i learned how to be a national sales manager with charlie and um, and and uh, was with Charlie until he sold uh, to General Cigar. So at this point, I'm two companies into the industry. Right. Both ended up in the hands of General what Cigars. What year was this then? Oh, good Lord. 2012? Like 12, 13, something like that probably. I think he sold maybe 15 or 16. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, something like that maybe. No, no, no. <clears throat> before then? But probably before then. Yeah, 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 yeah. Before then. But we had a good run. 2012? 13? <sighs> I so don't then, remember. okay, so oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. So it was a good time, had a great time. Charlie is um, obviously, he's always been a great friend, I think, to all of us. Still is, still is. Still a great friend. And um, I learned a lot from Charlie. Charlie was a, a great family guy. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, with CAO, I learned how to sell on a, we were bubbling and then we took off like a rocket ship. Tarano was a brand that had been kind of been around forever have been closed out a lot of places. We were kind of rebuilding the brand. Yeah. So I learned how to work a brand that needed a lot of TLC. And it wasn't a guarantee to get into a shop. So you had to really work it, a lot of events, a lot of, you had to rebuild that base. So that was an, a, a great experience. So my first two jobs in the business, learning how to work for a company that was just blowing up at CAO, working for a company that needed a lot of TLC, and we built Tarano. I mean, there's probably three of us that rebuilt that brand on the street. Um, and and uh, and and he Charlie wound up selling. And at that point, General didn't want anyone from Tarano. They just wanted a brand. Eventually, they would go back and hire some of the family. But um, and then I got the chance to work for Duran, Roberto P. Duran. Roberto, if you remember, he was uh, great in the Sugar Ray Leonard. Yo, fights. I mean, come on, amazing. Come on, yeah. Uh, there were a few of those people showed up with uh, boxing gloves. Hands of stone, signed, by the way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, it reminds me of the. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw the old Saturday Night Live skit. Uh, Joe Mon Montaigne, the yeah, actor, yeah, 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 is hosting, yeah. Yeah. and he's doing his opening monologue, and a couple families get up to leave, and he goes, "Whoa, where are you going?" And they all have 
49ers jerseys on. They're like, oh, we thought you were somebody sure. else hosting the show. <laughs> that's good. That's how. That's, that's how. That's good. Roberto uh, Duran. Yeah, people yeah. would show up with gloves to get them signed, and I'd be like, yeah, I don't want to uh, disappoint well, you, but. Yeah. But no, Roberto um, had worked for Habanos for many years. He worked uh, out of Canada, Vancouver area for Habanos, and then he joined Dunhill Cigars. And they were signed in our booth. range. Remember the Dunhill yeah. signed range? That was he a was good in our cigar. booth yeah. uh, a couple of years. We had mm-hmm. the, the Dunhill remember. booth and yeah. the CIO booth. That's right. And Roberto had launched. Uh, he had started his own fields in Ecuador and, and mm-hmm. Nicaragua, and so I joined him. And he taught me how to do the international business. Mm. That was something that was missing in my repertoire of, of sales. So I learned how to sell into Hong Kong, bring them. I, I met, I met a lot of people oh, and neat. working a brand that nobody had ever heard of mm-hmm. in the United States. What was the brand? It was Roberto P. Duran. And there was another brand called Azan. Okay. At the time, his wife uh, was from Cuba and her grandfather or great grandfather started a brand in Cuba in 19, 19- 01 or 1902 mm. called Azan. It was he was actually a Chinese immigrant to Cuba. Oh wow! And he won the the national lotto, and he actually created a cigar brand. And the factory is still in Cuba today. Mm. It's still, it's, it's uh they don't that brand no longer exists. Um, but Azan, so he kind of brought back that brand Azan. So today, Azan and Duran still survive in Canada and Asia Pacific markets. Interesting. No longer the American. But originally, market. it was made in Cuba. Originally, it was made in Cuba. Yeah. Where was it then made? In Nicaragua? In Nicaragua. In Nicaragua. Yeah, okay. by Radio Pichardo and oh, yeah, yeah, Roberto yeah. Okay. Duran. Okay. Yeah, they made that brand. Yeah. Oh, wow. So then you worked there for how long? I was with him for maybe be, maybe four years, maybe three, four years, something like that. Okay, so, so then, all the all the All the years get muddled. So when did you join Crowned Heads then? Well, John, um, thank God, John, uh, I always kept in contact with John. Um, you know, we both have love for baseball caps and, and things like that. And John had offered me to come on board a few times and always wanted to. I was like, if it doesn't work this time, forget <laughs> it. Cause like we got close. It was, it was the third time. The third time. So we went after you the first time. Yeah. And you didn't get there. Second time. I think we met at the trade show. Yep. Yep. Talked and we got really show. close and you said, give me a couple of weeks. What year was that? Probably 15, 15 probably. Yeah, yeah, probably 15. Yeah. And uh, you passed. And I was like, Fine. So it, like in 17, yeah, I went after you again. Yeah. And I was like, all right, if it doesn't work this time, it's not meant to be. And well, so you, you came on, like literally, I think April of 17, right? Right before yep. the trade show. My cat, uh, my cat actually talked to me about Crown Heads in 2011. Like who? Your, your, oh, no, your, business, your business partner. Oh, yeah, I forgot it. Yeah, that's, oh, yeah. <laughs> Mike had actually talked to me back then, and, and Mike gave me advice in 2011. He said, listen, either you know you join the new thing we're working on or not. He said, look, go out there and just get as much experience as you can as a sales guy. Doesn't matter who you work for. Just go out and get, it, get the experience. And after being a national sales manager and doing international sales, I wanted to stay at that, that position. Mm-hmm. And so that third time is where it was, hey, I think – we're big enough. Yeah, we we need the the help now yeah. um, to have uh, to have a national. And so that's really what I was holding out for. And every time, um, I was just hoping, like, man, I want to work for you guys again. I want to be a part of the team again. But I don't want. I want this position. And and luckily, very blessed to get that offer. And and uh, the rest. So is you history. came in then as a national sales manager to Crown Heads. Then I right came away. in as working territories becoming the national sales manager with the, the promise of once we get some of these territories going, we'll move you into that position. How and many, how many salesmen did crowd heads have when you 17, first two? Was it really two? It was Wes, two. Wes and, and Brian. Brian McGee. Well, that was it. That was it. So then and, and you then had Fia to, was a broker. So did you, was did you have to just then go to the key accounts or how did you kind of I start? Started, I started working the Midwest in the East coast. Uh, and just building up the, that, that area and, and started doing key accounts. And so I, I, I really was on the road every single day doing the Midwest, uh, the Bible belt sort of, um, where West didn't cover and then the, the Northeast. Were you living in Cincinnati living at that Cincinnati. time? Yep. Yeah. Okay. When did you move to Florida? Uh, about a year into the job. 
My wife uh, did not want to live in Cincinnati anymore. She was done with the cold. My wife's from Puerto Rico originally, so she likes that your hot wife's weather. Amazing. I love your thank wife. You, thank you. Thank you. Your wife. Uh, she she just she really wanted to move. And Mike has always said, "Look, as long as you live near an airport, that's all that really matters." And so my wife chose to. We actually moved first to uh, a little city called um, Dunedin, which is right outside Clearwater. And really couldn't find a community that we really wanted to build a house there. So we wound up moving closer to Fort Myers and built a house there. And that's where we are today. And so I she fly, loves it. Yeah, she loves the hot yeah, weather. That's great. I'm not so much a Florida yeah. person. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I like the cool, cold. Like I like the weather here, you know, in Tennessee. Um, but you travel a lot. I mean, you're one of the hardest working. Thank you, man. Men in the in the business, I would say. I'm on the road probably almost four weeks out of every month. Every month, but I love it. Yeah, talk yeah, to yeah, that. Yeah. Talk about that because there's a lot of people that watch this that probably go, "Man, I'd love to do that," but yeah. they don't. They don't realize what commitment, sacrifice it takes. Like how uh, much I, right I, time. I couldn't do it without the support of my wife. My 100%. wife is really the one that has given me the lead way to to do it. And there, there's a couple of months where I may be home, including weekends. There may be a few where I'm in my own bed six nights in one month. Yeah, you know, you got to go out, you got to work with your salespeople. We now have six in house salespeople. Yep. We have two brokers. Then there's me as a national. Uh, and it's really about working with them and then working key accounts, working international. And then you got to, I got to do events, right? So our friends at CI or our friends at Famous or our friends at Casa Monte Cristo, our salespeople don't handle those retailers. And so that's a house account, but we also have to work their stores and keep the brand going. So that's really 99% of what I do is keeping those accounts, doing events, uh, promoting the brand and, and working with my sales team, making mm -hmm. sure that they're trained and they're up and they're going and making sure that we keep in contact with some of our biggest supporters and, and that are in the industry. And I always look at it as my job is to be a liaison between the brand our retailer, our retail family, and you guys, mm -hmm. you, John, Mike, really the liaison between that. And as, and I think that's how you build a successful brand long term in this industry is that relationship building. Mm -hmm. And look, the United States is a big country. And so you constantly have to be traveling. You constantly have to be going. Uh, I think that's probably the number one thing people miss or don't really think about when they get into a sales position like the cigar industry the amount of travel hotel time or what we call shield you know behind your mm -hmm. windshield um hours and hours of driving yeah you before we did this you were telling me what you're almost at a million miles now yeah i'm about to hit a million miles with delta yeah. oh wow yeah that's yeah. insane yeah what yeah. advice would you give because i was in um i was in the dallas area like 10 days ago mm -hmm. and somebody came up to me and said oh uh, i would love to get in the cigar business you know, what, what's your recommendation? And I mean, I had a, rec but I wonder what your advice would be to somebody that wants to get in the cigar business. Let's say they want to get into the sales aspect of it. What would you, what would you advise someone to do? I always tell people to get in, to work as a rep. If you can't get into a rep, work at a retail shop. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the number one, when other national sales managers or someone like Rocky Patel may see me go, Hey, listen, I need a guy in such and such territory. Do you have anyone? And usually they're asking retail, is anyone working in a store that you would recommend? So one, if you can get a job at a store, even if it's part time, just so you become very visual to the reps, to the brands, get involved with events, go to multi vendors, uh, become very visual because that's it. This industry is is not a I'm going to posting a monster dot monster dot mm -hmm, job. Mm -hmm, this right. is a who do you know? Mm -hmm. Who's the person in the shop that you know that's hanging up that's having a good time that maybe wants to get into the industry? So either get a job at a shop part time or full time. And then the second thing is, is if you can get into the sales position of any cigar company, get in and get your feet wet. Mm -hmm. And the harder you work, the more time you put in, the more personable you are, then people will start looking at you as moving up in the industry, either with, um, you know, being a national sales manager, being a key counts manager. There's all these positions that are mm -hmm. available to you mm -hmm. uh, in this business, but it is a very competitive business. And most people that get in never leave. And so you really have to make a good name for yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's work hard, keep your word, and uh, and be present at all times. Yeah, that's what I told her. It was actually um, you know, a young woman that, that asked me that question. And I said, um, I told her that uh, exactly like I said to try to get a job at a at a store, you know, and then mm -hmm. it's you great know, way even to learn if the it's part too, time. Right? I mean it's a great way to learn cigars is yeah. at retail. Yeah. If you can learn it at retail, then yeah. you know, 
happy battle. I mean, you talk to any of rep, it doesn't matter if they work for the big guys, the mid guys, the small guys, most of the people were either one, hanging out in cigar shops very often, or two, worked at a cigar shop. And and usually that's yeah. where, you know, our, our, our rep Jake in Ohio, he worked at a cigar shop in Columbus. He wind up running a cigar bar in Indianapolis. And then we brought him on board. Right. Uh, Brian McGee, our rep in Texas, worked at a shop. Uh, and we hired him at CAO. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's such a, a mixture of, um, of different ways you can get in this business. Danny, who's our rep, who's based out of Milwaukee, Danny came from the retail side as well. And, Casa and, Monte Cristo. Yeah, Casa Monte Cristo, our good friends over there. That is really the way you get into the business. And you meet the reps. And then, like, you come to an event, let's say, and they meet you. And then maybe that name or that person impressed you. Do and they then, say to you, uh, hey, if there's ever an opportunity? Yes, all the time. They do, yeah. all the time. I would think that that would be the case because there's a sensitivity there that, like, yeah. we right. don't want to, like people say, of poaching other people. Mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? We've never been kind of... You know, Never. fans of that have done that. You know what I mean? And, and that, that yep. can be that can be sometimes a very sensitive very, thing, right. you know? Well, I'm very um, proud to say that in my entire career, we've never poached a person. Yeah. Um, we've been we've been approached by uh, employees of places saying, hey, I'm, I'm ready to make the leap or I really want to see if there's a position for me to move into. Uh, we've never gone out and headhunted anybody. Luckily, very blessed. I think it's the culture that you guys have created. People want to work for Crown Heads. People want to work for us. They want to work for our brands. And so we get approached quite a bit. And when that person seems like the right fit and we have a position, we give them an opportunity. Mm-hmm. And I think that's how we've built to six in-house, two brokers of people that are fiercely loyal, very proud, um, really enjoy what we're doing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's, I think, how you build long-term success in this business. And anyone out there who is interested in getting in the side of the business, um, you know, fall in love with cigars, fall in love with the brand. I mean, I think, you know, Tim, you were born into the industry, you know. John, you were essentially a, a cigar geek, right? Yeah. In the early Still 90s. Am. Yeah. Um, I was, a, uh, I mean, I would take my vacations to go to Big Smoke. You know what I mean, mm-hmm. and meet you guys, and that's and that's and me bugging you about how. Can how did I work you get your interested family? in cigars? So part of the culture, the Latin culture, cigars are part of the culture. So I'd see uncles, I'd see family members all smoking Teamos, a Mexican cigar. My background back, is Mexican. The they are. They're back. They're back. <laughs> they are back. Uh, without the hyphen, by the way, take yeah, the hyphen yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I was always intrigued by agriculture as well. I thought about studying agriculture in college. Uh, and so those are my two loves, right? I love agriculture. I love learning about that aspect of business. And then my love of cigars. I love the aroma. My father smoked a pipe. Uh, so the opportunity to get into the business at a very young age, I just was very intrigued mm-hmm. by it. And, and again, I, I mean, I was a cigar geek. I knew who John was. I saw John on these boards yeah. posting mm-hmm. and I thought, man, I'd love to do what that guy's doing, you know? And my road was a little bit different, right? my road was on the sales side and really fell in love with sales and that's what i've stuck to because i was every cigar rep in this business it's the worst kept secret we all want to be brand owners everybody wants to be a brand owner and so what's the closest way being around brand owners and 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 there's nothing that you pick any of our salespeople, john any salesperson and you guys send them a sample of a cigar you're working on to you, it's uh, give me your feedback. To mm-hmm. us, it is the world. Mm-hmm. To be just to be able to say you had the smallest part in that cigar, or is, you knew before yeah, everybody knew else, yeah, before anybody yeah. else. It was. It, it's. It's uh, as a cigar geek, that is awesome, man. It yeah. is awesome. You know, I travel with you quite a bit. We're doing a lot of events. Last year we did a ton of events. This year we've got behind the blends that we're doing, and you have a, a slider bag, and they're naked cigars. You break that out. There's nothing more exciting than that. I mean, as a cigar guy, getting handed a cigar by you or John with no ban on it, that there that's a cool, that's a really cool thing that that uh, I, you can ask any of our people. They, they get to smoke that. They're, they're on cloud nine, man. How do so. you feel that um, business is different, mm-hmm. um, let's say, 10 years ago yeah. or when you were at, um, let's say, let's use CAO as an example yep. versus now? The competition is a lot greater now. I would say that you would go into a shop at the at our height at CAO. They had a wall of General, a wall of Altidus, 
maybe a wall of Davidoff and Ashton, a wall of CAO, and then there was a wall of just a mix of stuff. Now there are more brands taking up shelf space than ever before. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think competition is very different today. Uh, I think cigars have gotten a little bit more expensive. I think the industry has continued to grow tremendously. Uh, humidors haven't necessarily grown, right? They've all pretty much very similar size. So now you have to really fight for your shelf space. And mm -hmm. I think the life of a brand, before you could put a brand on a shelf for a couple of years, mm -hmm. let's see if it builds. Now it's, if it's not with sell within six months, a retailer goes, I gotta get something else on the shelf. So I think today competition, I think, I know the consumer has much more information today. Back in 98, if a new cigar came out, I had to go to my local tobacconist and hear about it. Yeah. Uh, maybe you saw an added cigar fishing out of Maybe. That was it. That, that was that's how you mm -hmm. found out about new cigars. Social media changed everything. Changed the, and the game. Internet. Now that today's consumer is a lot more educated, more savvy. Yeah. 15 years ago, it's like, where was it made? Nicaragua or the Dominican Republic or Honduras? Yep. That's all they really knew. Yep. Now they're like into like the whole yeah. priming, viso, seco, ligero, like countries of origin, blending, blend, all that stuff. Yeah. When you when you guys came out with, uh, while well, I was there, CAO Criollo, the word Criollo, people could barely pronounce mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Now Criollo is a very common word in our industry. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of a double Maduro was almost unheard of, right? The there it was it was a different simpler. Every brand had a Connecticut, had yeah. a Maduro, and a Cameroon. Now Cameroon's pretty much been replaced by Habano. Mm -hmm. Ecuador wasn't as prevalent as it is today. And cigars cigar smokers pretty much were that mild to medium. Now you have mild medium and super full body guys, bigger ring gauges. It's expanded a lot. Even Vitolas have changed. I mm -hmm. mean, I remember when I was smoking back in the late nineties. A Robusto and a Churchill were the were what you smoked. Now there's Toro and Perfectos that come somewhat back and, and never saw a Lancero. I mean that was like unheard of. You still shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> Coronas. <laughs> I mean, you'd see a Corona in the nineties. Yeah. Uh, now it's hard. you don't see that as much. Uh, but it, even the definition of like a Robusto. Oh, changed. It was always five fifty. Right? Yeah. yeah. Now it's like I see things that are five fifty four and they're calling it a Robusto. I'm like, what? Five and a half by 56, sometimes people yeah, call it. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. it Crazy. Um, I remember when we had the 660s at CAO, and, and you know, was it going to be a trend? Who knows? Now 660 is a staple size. They call them Gordos. I think aficionado was, you know, established the Gordo name for anything like 660. That's a common size now, right? Now 770s and 880. So the industry has changed a lot. I think it's changed for the better. Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, much more sampling, Re consumers sample much more, where before they'd go in and buy their favorite box, and that's yeah. what they smoked. They were brand loyal. Yeah, now they, that's, that's, you nailed it. I think yeah. back then they would walk in once a week, say, give me my box of XYZ, yep. and that's all I'm doing. Now, you just want to get in that rotation. 100%. It's like that craft beer mentality. They want what's new, and they want to know what's new before everybody else does. And a retailer will tell you, hey, that guy is buying a box of cigars. I mean, instead of buying a whole box a week, he's buying 20 or 25 loose cigars. I think that's why you see more 10 counts in regular production yeah. now, too. Yeah, yeah. 10 counts, uh, you know, great for events, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Unfortunately, uh, some retailers love them, some retailers hate them. Some retailers hate the fact they have to replace the cigar so often because there's only 10 in a box, mm -hmm. you know. But I think the industry has changed in that way. You very rarely do, do you do an event now where someone's coming and buying two, three boxes at one event, where back in the day at CAO, it was very common for us to have consumers come in and buy three or four boxes, right. but they, they smoked CAO gold. That's what they smoked. They weren't smoking anything else, but now they're smoking a ton of stuff. Today's consumer is probably uh, benefits from how good the tobacco is today, how good fermentation has become, how good the blends have become across the board. They really have benefited from this incredible boom in cigar making right now. And it's exciting. I mean, it's really, really, really exciting to they see. They're also like really into baseball and baseball culture. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about that a bit? I mean, that you have hats that you, you make that are cool. Thank you. So, yeah, I um, uh, cigars were my hobby and baseball was my hobby. Then 
cigars became my job and career. Did you play baseball growing up? You know what? I think I love baseball so much because I couldn't hit a ball. Huh. I played football, and all I wanted to do was play baseball. Huh. But I couldn't hit a ball. And I love the history of baseball. You can tell the history of our country through baseball. You know, during the Civil War, literally there were places that they would on Sunday stop fighting, and the North and South would get their nine best ball players, and they play a, a game on a war field. So you like that as opposed to football history? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I couldn't tell you much about football at all. I know that the the museum is in Canton, Ohio for football. Yeah, I'm a right. baseball guy through and through. I love baseball. Is, goes further back, way, way further football. back. I mean, way the back. Reds, Cincinnati Reds, were established in 1869. Yeah. And so when you look at the the birth of America, where after the Civil War, really where our country started to come into the baseball, was part of that, bringing people together after the Civil War. Um, it really, uh, it, Brooklyn, New York is really kind of where baseball became baseball. Yeah. And I just love the history of baseball, the Negro Leagues. And luckily, because of my job, I travel so much. I get to go to a lot of baseball museums. I get to go oh, to cool. games. And I get to see a lot of things out there. And I think John and I both have love for baseball caps. How many do you have? Just for the record, I want to know because if my wife ever watches this and complains yeah. about how many hats I have, I want you to I, say, I'm, I have. I'm down to 500 hats now. Down to wow. 500. Down to 500 baseball caps. You don't even have but you 500 create, You create warehouse. baseball caps I do. too, right? So my wife and I, as a little hobby, my kids pick, pack the boxes. My wife prints out the shipping things. <laughs> we have a, a, a website called Edencia21, H-E-R-E-N-C-I-A, the number 21.com. We make hats inspired by Latin baseball. So I love when I, I love traveling to Latin America, not just for cigars, but for vacation. And my wife being from the Caribbean, I watch my fair amount of Caribbean baseball, Latin baseball. And so I always was like John, always after a hat, wherever I went, I wanted a hat. And I would buy these hats in different places in Latin America and the Caribbean. And just the quality wasn't there. Hmm. You'd wear them two or three times and they were just, right. they were useless. And so I said, you know what? I want to create a hat inspired by my love of baseball, Latin baseball. So long story short, I, I really wanted to just have a little side hobby that I could, because on the website, I have a blog and I write about baseball in my free time and sell hats and pins. Do you have a favorite team, Latin American team that you think is... Yeah, you follow? my wife uh, is from Puerto Rico, and there's a team that Roberto Clemente played for when he played on the island called the Santorce Cangrejeros. I have the habitat. You have the habitat. Yep. You have, yeah. Yep. Uh, Santorce is basically a neighborhood in San Juan, and Cangrejeros translates to the crabbers. And I, they have the this letter S as their logo, mm -hmm. which is just awesome. I have jerseys and all that kind of That's stuff. Cool. I love that. And then <clears> in Cuba, there's a team at Pinar de Rio, and their logo is literally a baseball wrapped in a tobacco leaf. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. That's so, neat. I love that stuff, man. In Mexico, I love uh, the, the Sultans de Matarrey, Mexico. And uh, yeah, yeah. What yeah, city I, was the Cafeteros? The Cafeteros was a little town. I don't remember the name of the city. Oh, uh, Cordoba. Cordoba, Mexico. Yep. Cordoba, Mexico. I love that logo. How so, many teams are there? There are hundreds of teams really? in Latin America, but there are different league levels. I see. So in Mexico, for example, they have about five levels, but two that people really pay attention to. So there's a Pacific League, uh, and then there is the the regular league. So one plays in the summer, one plays in the winter. And uh, it's, pretty, it's awesome. It's awesome because if you go to those games, you can see retired baseball players playing or coaching. Yadier Molina, uh, legendary Cardinals catcher, I mean, he always – played or coached for a team in, in, in Puerto Rico called the uh, Caguas de Criollos. And I just, I love that stuff, man. Yeah, and and, and if shit. you love like fashion or you're interested in baseball jerseys and the whole aesthetic of baseball, Ebbsfield flannels, like we do those hats. I just love that stuff, man. Yeah, I was, love it. They I think, do a great job. They're yeah. like straight up historians with historians. that. Historians. Yeah. Huh. Speaking yeah. of fashion, this woman, uh, a woman named Stacy Bozeman, Shout out to her. Gave me this bracelet this past weekend. She makes uh, bracelets out of uh, cigar bands. Have you seen this? I've seen it. 
So, you know what? Right, I, I, met saw her, her. I, I met her through watch at first. No, I met her through uh, Craig Cass. That is awesome. At uh, awesome. Tinderbox Charlotte. Hell of a watch. And then she's like, uh, can I have some of your bands? <laughs> so we ended up sending her a whole bunch of bands. And then she was there this weekend at the Great Smoke and came. Oh, that, that is that's great. great. I didn't really know cool. that you got oh, I was with you at the Great Smoke. Yeah, I didn't yeah, know she got yeah, oh, That's yeah, awesome. I saw her before it started. That's awesome. Yeah. That is awesome. So, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Those multi-vendor events segue. are awesome. You get to meet some incredible consumers, you know, people that have been longtime fans. Yeah, and, that wasn't something that existed that much when I was no. you know, 10, 10, 13 was years ago. Smokes. That was it. That big was smoke it. was it. Because I, I, I was that consumer. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to meet you guys, I'd have to find a, a, an event on the road, which weren't as prevalent as they are today. Or I'd have to come to the Big Smoke to see you guys. So I and would even take at the trip. Big Smoke, you don't really have time to, no, you know, you no. just kind of come in, get your cigar. You right, know, John, right. what I would do is, be, you really had no time. It was take a picture, maybe mm -hmm. uh, shake a hand, get your cigar. But what I would do is I'd hang out afterwards. Mm -hmm. And then I would hang mm -hmm. out around the CAO booth. And then when the event really coming out of the last half an hour, that's when I would kind of move in. Like and, a group. Right, yeah, yeah. Well, 100%, 100%, bro. 100%. And my, you know, <laughs> no, I got to tell you, good. my wife would be like, wow, this, this is... You're really into cigars. When I met her, because I had a human <laughs> and everything, I was like, wow, you're really into the cigars, huh? And uh, But and is then, it not the biggest blessing to do what you love for a living? 100%. You know what I mean? 100%. It's like you never really feel like you're working. Yeah, that, that, that's that, what your dad used to always like, say. Like, yeah. John will always say, you find what you love, and you'll never work a day in your life. Yeah. I'll never forget I, that. Your worst day is better yeah. than someone who hates their job on their best day. How and do I, you, um, you have you have quite a pace, you know what I mean? You're always positive. Mm -hmm. Um, so how do you kind of keep yourself going? Um, how do you keep yourself sort of, uh, you know what I mean? Like recharged, yeah. that kind Steady of thing. Steady died of blow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Johnny Manziel reference. Is, anyway, oh, is it really? Yeah, no, I, I just, I saw him on a podcast. Anyway. Is that what he said? Yeah. Because, oh, okay. uh, Good Shannon Sharp, Shannon Sharp said something about like, how did you lose all that weight? And he's like, a steady, steady died of blow. Oh, I, was, yeah. I was, uh, a Coke Zero. Coke that's Zero. That's my, that's how I. How I keep going is uh, Coke Zero. I think for me, uh, I think I've always been a pretty happy, um, yeah, positive yeah, person. Yeah. Uh, I've told this story many times, so I won't go into it. But in 2007, I had a brain tumor. And then the day after I had the brain tumor removed, I had a stroke at the hospital. And so I was on a walker. I was working for CAO at I the time. I remember this. You let me write a blog that we had a blog. You let me write that blog. Uh, and you gave me great positive feedback on that. Your family continued to take care of me when I was at CAO and I couldn't work for six months. Uh, I think when you go through something like that, everything else, you're just happy to be alive. You're happy mm. to be working. You're happy to be able to get up every morning. And I may wake up seven days in a row in a different hotel. Listen, man, I, I know what it was like to be stuck in a rehabilitation hospital with a walker. You know, not being able to chew my food. Mm. Uh, I got a cool scar now, though, which is pretty neat. Um, and you stopped wearing the Bluetooth. Stopped wearing the Bluetooth. Yeah. Stopped wearing Bluetooth. Oh, you were wearing Bluetooth. Yeah. Was, that's, you know, they can't. I did they tell you nervous. to stop wearing it? or My or? doctor did. He said, oh, he did. Eh, just be safe. Don't start wearing it on the other end. Okay. Just in case. Uh, and so when you go through that, I think in general, you just appreciate more the blessings. You get these blessings every day in your life. And I think 90% of them, people just kind of overlook them. But just the fact, it took me years to be able to drive at night. With the, At night, it's dark. With the, the, the surgery they had to do, I have a little problem sometimes with balance driving at night. So after retraining myself to drive at night, like even though a little thing, I got to drive now after this event two hours to my hotel. Listen, I will take that any day. So... You go through those things and you come out stronger and you go, man, like I'm I'm blessed to just be here. So yeah. I, I rarely, rarely ever get down. Um, I remember uh, uh, one rep that I'm, I, I know very well. He goes, when I met you, I always thought, man, this guy's got to be fake. He can't always be this happy. <laughs> and he goes, I've known you now for eight years. You're always in a good mood. And, I've known you and, for 20. And it's, I'll vouch for that. Yeah. I've never yeah. seen you upset or mm -hmm. anything. It's been mm -hmm. a blessing to know you for sure, 100%. It's about that attitude of gratitude, man. I saw something that physiologically, your brain cannot process gratitude and anxiety at the same time. Mm. So if you just focus on what you're grateful for, the rest of that stuff, you can't be in a bad mood, you know? 100%. Yeah, that's that's a really good lesson, yeah. That's true. That, that's, that's, wow. I never, that, that makes sense. I mean, I'm, I feel very blessed every day to do, get up and even go to the grocery store, man. Like, I'm happy, man. 
I'm 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 happy to do what we do. Even when you have to bag your own groceries. I'm not That's very, a pet peeve of mine, way, man. Going to a grocery yeah, store, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, why am I paying all this? Because you got nobody working here. I'm yeah. like, I got to work here. Well, let me tell you, uh, that's that's something I can say about Florida. Is they have these grocery stores called Publix. Yeah, we have Publix. Okay, well, in Cincinnati, this is not something new. I well, mean, in Cincinnati, we had Kroger. We have those as well. Okay, well, well, this is where they meet. Okay. So we didn't have Publix. The Publix not only do they always have baggers. They try to take your groceries to your car. Yeah, because they want that tip. Yeah. No. Yeah, they want they the tip. They were a sign. What's it say? It says no, no tip. tip. Really? No tips accepted. Florida, all right. Yeah. So um, so that's the one thing. I, Publix is awesome, man. So, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. That's great. Well, I mean, you're a... Uh, um, you're a great person. It's a privilege to know you and be around you and work with you. Um, you're always positive. Thank you're you. always fun to travel with. Thank you. And uh, and I can always see that. That um, you know, I always view it as like you have to be someone that people are looking forward to see. And I know that all the retailers that we visit always like to see you. So that's a Thank that's you, a man. compliment and a reflection of who you are and your your approach. Thank you, man. I I literally I, I when people ask me about this business. I always I always mention four people. I say I had I had the extreme luck, blessings to work with your father, to work with you, to work with Mike, and to work with John. The fact that I have been able to where's Mickey Peg? To... <laughs> I was waiting. Wait. Mickey, Mickey, dude. He's sitting there right now in his in his like footy pajamas going. What do you mean, coach? I've had this blessing to work with you guys, and man, is it is it a blessing to do it? And I tell everyone, everyone, they go when you go out and sell Crown Heads, when you go out and sell Oz uh, cigars, man, you really you love this, you're passionate. I said, well, I'm not only selling you cigars, I'm selling you the people behind the brand. I said, you know, John, literally, John bleeds tobacco. The man bleeds these blends and the creativity. That is so admiring that someone is so in-depth into their art. To be able to be the guy who brings that art and delivers it to consumers and retailers, I feel very blessed to do. The fact that your family had such a huge impact on not only the cigar industry, but the pipe industry. And I and you guys really took incredible care of me when I was down sick. I said, I'm not just selling their cigar. I'm selling the people behind it, the Osgoner family, you, your father. It's a blessing, man. Like I, I, you know, it's not just about loving the industry. It's about selling what you're passionate about. And I've been very blessed in this industry to work for people that I admire and that are good human beings. Well, and I think when you're you. passionate about it, it's not really selling. Yeah, no, you know you're I mean? exactly right. And that's why I like, yeah. I like how you go about things because I don't feel like I'm being sold on something mm -hmm. or tricked into buying something. Yeah. It's yeah. like you're passionate about it yeah. and people vibe with that. So, And it is so exciting to go to an event and have a person come to the event. They could pick up a box of Oz. They could pick up a box of crap. It does whatever they're picking up and their hard earned money. They love the brand. They connect with the brand. That is such an amazing feeling that 21 years in this business, I still get excited about that people come out and care and spend their time. It is, it's a, it's a very rewarding part of this business. And this industry, never take it for granted. You know, this industry, you talk to some of the old timers, the 80s was, was a rough time for this industry. You didn't know the, how the industry was going to fare. Mike Condor kind of tells stories about those <laughs> days. <laughs> the dark days. Well, back in uh, the salad days. You know, Charlie Tronya's father, when he was alive, you know, he would tell me oh, the 80s were rough. And the fact that, and then with the FDA, with taxation, mm -hmm. we're very blessed. And I think all of us are playing this role in this incredible culture that you can trace back um, hundreds of years to the indigenous people that were smoking tobacco. You can trace this culture of cigars back to that. And all of us have a little input, a little, um, a little stake in keeping this culture alive and, and keeping the flag of premium cigars going to the next generation. Uh, handmade product, something very unique in a world of digital, in a world of machines, in a world of batteries and yeah, cell they'll, phones. They'll never be able to get an AI to make a good cigar. You'll never be able to have a machine that can make a cigar like a hand-rolled cigar. Right. Mm -hmm. And that is very important that we keep alive, and we all are playing a role in that. But you're great. I mean, uh, um, you know, we love you over here. You're part of the family, and, uh, you know, 
it's never like one person. It's always a team that succeeds. So I think part of yeah. building a really, you know, good team that loves what they do and can convey the product with, you know, sincere passion yeah. as to what it is is really important. So, so thank you. Thank you for yep. everything that you do and you bring to the industry. You guys are awesome. So are you. <laughs> you are. It's, I know you are, but what am I? <laughs> um, I guess that'll be a wrap. So uh, till the next one, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Keep smoking crown heads. Keep smoking Oz family cigars. That you're just in time. And we'll catch you on number 15 next time. Thank you guys. Thank Later, you, sir. <laughs> Thank you guys. You guys yes, are sir. awesome. Thanks.